Hey everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Ansible Fest 2022. We're live in Chicago. This is day two of wall-to-wall -wall coverage on theCUBE. John Furrier here with me, Lisa Martin. John, today's a big news day. Yeah, big time. I mean, we got the chief architect on this segment, it's going to be great. We have the lead product management. All the new stuff coming out really is a game changer. It's very cool and relevant, very key to be relevant and, then, and being a part of the future. This is a changeover. You see in the next gen cloud, developer environment, open source, all coming together. So Ansible, we've been covering for many, many years, we always said they're in the middle of all the action and you're starting to see the picture yes. forming, so we're looking forward to a great segment. Yes, yeah, so we've got two alumni back with us to unpack the news and all the great stuff that's going on here. Richard Henschel joins us, Senior Manager, Ansible Product Management, and Matthew Jones is here, fresh from the keynote stage, Chief Architect of Ansible Automation. Guys, great to have you on the yeah. program. Thanks, Thanks for having us, good to be here. So this morning was all about event-driven Ansible. Unpack that, talk about the impact that this is going to have the excitement, the buzz that you've heard on the show floor today. Yeah, you know, it's it's exciting. We've been working on this for a while. We've been really excited to show this off because it's something that feels like the natural evolution of the platform and where it's going. Really being able to connect the automation with the sources of data and the actions that we know people want to use. We, we came into this knowing everybody here at this conference, this is something that everybody will be able to use. Talk about the innovation strategy, because we've always had these great conversations with Ansible. Oh yeah, the, the practitioners, they're, they're building the product with you. You guys are very hardcore on that, no secret. This is different. This is like a whole nother level of opportunity that's going to take the, the community to new heights in terms of what they do in their job and free them up to do more creative development. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, we, we know that people need to bring that sort of uh, reactive and active automation to it. We've, we've done a lot of work to bring automation to everybody, to the masses. Uh, now we need to meet them at the place where they are, where, the, the, where, where they have to do the most work and, and act in the most strategic and specific ways. All right, so now before we get into some of the deep dive, because a ton of questions, this is a really exciting product. Take a minute to explain what was the key announcement? Why, what specifically does this mean for the audience watching customers and future customers? What's the big deal? To so take a minute to explain what was announced. So this is about the, <clears throat> the evolution and the maturity of the automation that our users are doing. So, you know, you think about provisioning servers, you know, configuring networks, all that sort of the stuff that we've established and everybody's been doing for a number of years. And then you go, well, I've invested in that. I've done the heavy lifting. I've done the things that cost me agility. I think you know, that, co that cost me time. Well, now I need to go further. So what can I go further into? And you move further up the stack. So you move away from the infrastructure piece. You move away from infrastructure as code. You move towards, through config as code, up to ops as code. And you start to get into, well, I've got, I've got rote tasks. I've got repetitive actions that I'm doing. I've got investigations. I've got remediations. I've got responses. All this work that I do on a daily basis that is toil, right? It's not efficient work. Well, I should be doing valuable work in the operation space as much as I should be doing in the, in the build space. And how do we move them up into that space? And it's, it's, this is all based off observation. You can do this today, but how do we make it easier? We've got to make it easier for them to do that and get, you know, it's all about success, it's about the outcomes we're trying to drive users towards. They need to be successful as quickly as possible. How do we make that happen? And Matt, I remember when we talked in 2019 with Ansible, the word platform, we're, we say, hey, you know, platforms are super important. It's not a tool. Tools and platforms as distinctions. You mentioned platform. This is now platform. A lot of people put a lot of work in, into yeah. this. Take, explain what went on behind the scenes. So you're exactly right. And we've spent the last couple of years really taking that disparate set of tools that, that we've invested a lot of time in, building that platform. Uh, it's been exciting to see it come together. We always knew that we wanted to capture more of uh, more of where people find automation and find they need automation, not just out on the edge, on the end of the, of the, of the actions and tasks that they need to do. Uh, they've got a lot of things coming in, a lot of things that they need to take care of, and the community is really what drives this for us. People have been doing this for years, and they've been asking us, meet me halfway, give me something, give me a part of this platform and a capability that enables me to do this. So, I, 
feel like we've done that. And you that. did it. Yeah, exactly. For step one. And that, that must feel pretty good too, to be able to deliver what you know the masses are looking for and why they're looking for it. Yeah, this was, there was no question that we knew this was going to deliver the kind of real value that people were looking for. Take us through the building blocks real quick. I know on stage you went through it in detail. What should people know about the core building blocks of, of this particular event-driven piece yeah, of it? You know, I think the most important thing to understand at the, at the outset is uh, the sources of data and events that come in. It's really easy to get lost in the details, like what do you mean a source? But you know, we've shown examples using Kafka, but it's not just Kafka, right? It's, uh, it's, it's webhooks, it's CI systems, it's any, any place that you can Im imagine an event coming from, your monitoring platforms, you can bring those together under the same umbrella we're not requiring you to pick one or choose or what's your favorite one. You can bring, you can use them all and, and condense them down into the into the same place. Okay. There's a lot of data events everywhere now. There's more events. Yeah. Is there a standard interface? Is what's the? Is there any kind of hook in there? Is what's what's going to limit? Or is there any limits? I, I don't think there is a limit. I you know it, and we can't even imagine where events and data are going to come from, but we know we need to get them into the system in a way that. Uh, makes the most sense for the, cool. the customers. And then that that drives through into the rule books, like, okay, we have the data now, but what do we do with that data? How do we translate that into, into the action? What are the rules that need to follow? It's giving the, the, the person who is automating, who understands the data that's coming in and understands the tasks that they need to take, the, the rules are where they map those into it. And then the last part, of course, is the playbook, the automation itself, which they already know. They're already experts in the system. So we, we've, we've built this like eight lane highway that gets them right into those actions. Let's talk about, Richard, let's unpack those actions and the really kind of double click on the business outcomes that this is actually going to enable organizations in any industry to achieve. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it, like Matt said, it's really hard to encapsulate everything that we see as possible, but if you just think about what happens when a system goes down, right? At that point in time, I'm potentially not making money. I'm, right. so it's costing me time, it's costing me, that's a business impact. If I can speed up how quick I can resolve that problem. If I can reduce time in there, that's customer improvement, that's customer satisfaction, that's bottom line money for businesses, right? But it's also, it's also satisfaction for the users. You know, they're not involved in having the stressful, get online, get quickly activate whatever accounts you need to do, go and start doing discovery. You can detect a lot of that information for the discovery use case that we see, respond to an event, scan the system for that same logic that you would normally do as a user, as a human. And that's why the rules are important to add into EDA. It's like, how do I take that human, that brain part that I would say, well, if I see this bit, then I'll go and have a look in this other log file. If I see this piece, I'll go and do something different. How do we translate that into Ansible so that you've got that conditional logic just to be able to say, if this, do that, or if I see these three things, it means a certain outcome has happened. And then getting that defined, that's what's going to help people like, choose where it becomes useful. And that's how, we, that's how we take that process forward. I'm sure people are going to get excited by this. I'm not sure the community already knows that, but as it's going to attract more potential mm -hmm. customers, what's different about it? Can you share the differentiation? Like, Wait a minute, I already have that already. Do they have it already? What's different? What makes this different? What's, what's in it for them? Yeah, when we step up into a customer situation, an enterprise, an organization, What's really important becomes the, the ability to control where you do some of that work, so the control and the trust. You know, would you trust um, an automatic system to go and start making changes to hundreds or thousands of devices? And the answer is often not, not straight away. So how do we put this sort of sep the same separation of duties we have between dev and ops and all the nice structures we've done over the last number of years? and actually apply that to that programmatic access of automation that other systems do. So let's say AIML systems that are detecting what's going on, observability platforms are much more intrusive, intrusive is the wrong word, <laughs> they're much more um, observable of what's going on in the systems, right? But at the same time, you go, I, I want to make sure that I know that at any point in time I can decide what, what is there and what can be run and who can run it and when they can run it. And that becomes an important dimension. The versatility seems like a big deal too. They can, yeah. Any team could, Yep. get involved. And, and that's the, yeah, the same flexibility and the same extensibility of Ansible exists in this use case. Right? The, the, the ability to take any of those tasks you want to do in action, string them together, and what, the way that it works for you, not the way that it works that we see, but the way that you see, and you convert your operational DNA 
into how you do that automation, and then how that gets triggered as you see fit. Talk about this, both of you, I'd like to get your perspectives on event-driven Ansible as part of the automation journey that businesses are on. Obviously, you can look at different industries and different businesses are, are at different places along that journey, but where does this fit in and kind of plug in to accelerating that journey? That's, that's a good question. You know, sometimes this ends up being like that last mile of we've adopted this automation, we've learned how to write automation, uh, we even understand the things that we would need to automate, um, but how do we carry it over that last hump and connect it to our, our knowledge systems, our data stores, our data lakes, and how do we combine the expertise of the systems that we're managing with this automation that we've learned? Like you mentioned the, the, the community and the, the coalescing of data and information. The, uh, the definition of the event rules and, and the event-driven architecture lives alongside the automation that you've developed in the exact same place where you can feel that trust and ubiquity that we keep talking about, right? Um, it's there, it's certified, and we've talked a lot about uh, secure supply chain recently. This gives you the ability to sign and certify that the rules and actions that we're taking and the sources that we're communicating with works exactly yeah. the same way. And there's something we didn't, we didn't correlate this when we first started doing the work. We were, we were, we were deserved teams doing self-healing and you know, extending yeah. Ansible. And then over the last 18 months, what we've also seen is this movement, this platform engineering movement, the SRE teams yep. becoming much more prominent. And this just nicely sits in as a type of use case for that type of transformation. You know, we've got to remember that Ansible at its heart is also a transformative tool. It's like, how do you teach this behavior to a bunch of people? How do you upskill a larger base of engineers yep. with what you want to be able to do? And I think this is such an important part that we, we just, I wouldn't say we were stumbled into it, but it was a very, very nice. It was a natural yeah, progression. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Tom. Yeah. Tom. When we were talking with Tom yesterday, Tom Anderson, he, and he said, "You got to bring up the SRE to you guys when, when you come on the cube." This is exactly a culture shift mm -hmm. that we're talking about. I mean, SRE is really. It's legacy with Google, we all know that. Everyone kind of knows that. But it's become like a job title. <laughs> well, they kind of, what does that even mean now? <laughs> if you're not Google, it means you're running stuff. Um, DevOps has become a title. Yeah. So what that means is that's a cultural shift, not so much semantics yeah. on title. This is kind of what you guys are targeting here, enabling people to run platforms, engineer them yeah. like an architect, and, and enable more co composability coding. And, it, and it's so, that's, that distinction is so important because one of the, you know, we see many customers come from different places, many users from you know, all the little legacy or heritage of tools that have existed. And so often those processes are defined by the way that tool worked. Well, you had no other way that that, and, the, and it's, it happened 10 years ago. Somebody implemented it, that's how it now works. And then they come and try and take something new and you go, well you can't let the tool define your process. Now your culture and your objective has to define the process. So this is really, you know, how do we make sure we match that ability by giving yeah. them a flexible tool that lets you, well what are you trying to achieve? I want to achieve this outcome. That's the way you can do it. I mean that's SRE, Matt, basically it. means, in yeah. my mind, I mean, tell me get your reaction, it means I'm running stuff at scale. Yep. Uh, engineer, I'm engineering an infrastructure at scale to enable I high own this. I'm responsible for it, and it's it's my it's my baby. It's my responsibility to do that. And uh, how do we how do we allow people to do that better? And you know, it, it's about it's about freeing people up to focus on things that are really important and transformative. We can be transformative, and we do that by taking away the complexity and making things work faster. And that's what people want. People in their daily jobs want to be able to deliver value to the organization, you want to feel that. But something, Richard, that you were talking about that struck me a couple minutes ago was, was Adventure of an Ansible, there's employee benefits, there's customer benefits, those two are inextricably linked, but I like how you were talking about what it facilitates for both, and yes. all the way to the customer satisfaction, yeah. brand reputation. That's an important yeah. element for any brand to consider. And that, I mean, you know, think about what digital transformation was all about. I mean, as we evolve past all these initial terms that come about, you know, we actually start getting to the meat of what these things are, and that is it. Connecting what you do with actually what is the purpose of what your business is trying to achieve. And you can't, I mean, you can't almost put money on that. That's that's the that's the holy grail of what you're trying to get to. So how you know? And again, it just comes back to how do we facilitate? How do we make it easier? If we don't make it easier, we're not doing it right. We've got to make it easier, right? Well, exciting news! I want to get your guys' reaction, and if you don't mind sharing your opinion or your commentary on what's different now with Ansible this year than just a few years ago in terms of the scope of what's out there, what's been built, 
what you guys are doing for the, for the customer base and the community. What's changed? Obviously people's roles look like they're going to expand and have more, I say more power, you know, more keys to the kingdom, however you want to look at it, but things have changed. What's changed now from a few years ago? It's, you know, it, it's funny because we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years setting up the capabilities that you're seeing us deliver right now, right? We, we look back two or three years ago and we knew where we wanted to be. We wanted to build things like EDA. We wanted to invest in systems like Project Wisdom and the, the types of content, the cloud journey that, that now we're on and we're enabling for folks. But we had to make some really big changes and those changes take time and, and take investment. Uh, the move into, last year, John, we talked about execution environments yeah. and separating the control plane from the execution plane. All of that work that we did and the investment into the platform and stability of the platform leads us now into what capabilities. And that's an architectural decision, that's the long game in mind, exactly. making things more cohesive but decoupled. That's an operating system kind of thinking. It, it totally is. It, it's a systems engineering and system architecture thinking. And now we can start building on top of these things. Like, what comes after EDA? What does EDA allow us to do within the platform? Uh, all of the dev tools that we focused on, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about that from the product side, but being coming in with uh, prescriptive and opinionated dev tools, now we can show you how to build it, we can show you how to use it and connect it to your systems. Where can we go next? I'm really excited. Yeah, your customer base too has also been part of from the beginning and they saw their own problems and they rolled it up, grew with it, and now it's a full on platform. The question I then ask is, okay, if we believe it's a platform, which it is, it's enabling. What do you guys see as that possible dots that could connect that might come on top of this? Uh, from a creativity standpoint, from an ecosystem standpoint, from an Ansible standpoint, from maybe Red Hat, I mean wisdom shows that you can go into the treasure trove of IBM's research, pull out some AI yeah. and some machine learning, bolt that in or shim layer it in, whatever you do. I mean what I'm starting to see much more, especially as I, you know, the, the nice thing about being here is actually getting face to face with customers again, and you're actually hearing what they're talking about. But you know, we've moved away from a, Ansible specific story, where I'm talking about how I, um, I was always I was looking to automate, I was looking to go to Ansible. Well now I've got the automation capability. Now we've enhanced the automation capability. Wisdom enhances the automation capability further. What about all those, those broader set of management solutions that I've got that I would like to start connecting to each other? So we're starting to take the same, like you, know, you, you mentioned just then, software architecture, software design principles. Well apply those same application design principles. Apply them to your IT management because we've got data center with the pressures on there, we've got the expansion into cloud, we've got the expansion to the edge, right? Each layer adding a new layer of complexity and a new layer of you know, more that you have to then look after. But there's still the same number of people. So a thousand flower blooms kind yeah. of situation. Exactly, and so how do, I, how do I constrain, how do I tame it? Right? How do I sit there and go, I, I can control that now, I can look after that, I can tame that, I can, I can deal with what I want to do, so I'm focusing on what's important and we're getting stuff done. We, we've been quoting Andy Grove on the Cube lately, let chaos reign and then reign in the chaos. Yes, right. I mean, that's kind of yeah. every inflection point, has complexity before yeah. it gets simpler. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. You can't, there's no answer to that one, is That's there? right. <laughs> you said it perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you expect to see? Chief architect, you got to have the vision. What's going to pop out? What's the low, low hanging fruit? What's going to bloom first? What do you think is going to come? I, you know, my overarching vision is that I just want to be able to automate more. Where, where can we bring back, so edge, cloud, right? That's obvious. But uh, what things run in the cloud and, and on the edge, right? Devices, you heard Chad in the keynote yeah. this morning talk about programmable logic controllers, sensors, fans, yeah. motors, things yeah. like that. Uh, this is the, the sort of, uh, this is the next frontier of automation is that connecting your data centers and your systems, your applications and needs all the way out to where your customers are, gas stations, yeah. Uh, point of sale systems. I, I it's, think instant, it's instant IT is what it is. It's like just add, yeah. just yeah. add faster and bigger. Yeah. So. yeah. But what happens? If, well, I'll give you a tease. What I think is, is <laughs> right. what happens. This happens. Um, so I've got a much more rich, feature-rich, um, diverse set of tools looking after my systems, observing what's going on, um, and they go through a whole filtering process and they say such and such has happened. Right. Wisdom picks that up and decides from that natural language statement that comes out the back of that system, that's the task I think is now appropriate to run. Where do you run that? You need a secure execution capability. Pass that to Ansible, that single task can now be run inside the automation platform at any of those locations that you just mentioned. Right? Stitching those things together and having that sequence of events all the way through where 
you, you predefine what's possible. You know, you start to bias the system towards what is your accepted standard, and then let those clever systems do what you're investing in them for, which is to run your IT and make it easier. Uh, Rich here was on earlier, I said, hey, how about voice activated IT? <laughs> yeah. Provision the cluster. Yeah. <laughs> Last question, guys, before we run out of time. Uh, for this, for customers to take advantage of this new frontier, how can they get started with the venture finance ball? What's That's a good question. You know, we, we've engaged our community because they trust us and we trust them to build really good products. Uh, Ansible.com slash events. Uh, oh man, I'm, I'm I did like, have the, I had the card. <laughs> the we'll, landing page. We'll find, uh, somebody find that. Well, it's on GitHub, right? Yes, yes. GitHub. It is. Yeah, it is, yeah, absolutely. Ansible.com, there's probably a link somewhere, probably on the front page. Yeah, exactly. um, on GitHub, look at code too, right? Exactly, yeah. and so look at there, you can see where we're going on our roadmap what we're capable of today, examples. We're going to be doing labs and blogs and demonstrations of it over the next day, week, yeah. month, right? You'll be able to see this evolve. You get to be the, the sort of vanguard of support and, and actions yeah. on this. And Because uh, we, really we really want users to play with it. Right, we've, we've been doing this for a while. We've seen yeah. what we think is right. We want users to play with it, tell us whether the syntax works, whether it makes sense, how does it run, how does it work. That's the exciting part. But at the same time, yeah. we want the partners, you know, we, we don't know all the technologies, right? We want the partners that we have that work with us already in the community to go and sort of, you know, do those integrations, do those triggers to their systems, define rules for their stuff, because they'll talk to their customers about it as well. Right. right. It'll be exciting to see what unfolds over the next six to nine months or mm. so with the partners getting involved, the community getting involved. Guys, congratulations on the big announcement. It sounds like okay. a lot of work. I can tell, we can tell your excitement level is huge. And job well done. Thank you so much for joining us on theCUBE. Thank you very Thank much. You. Our pleasure. Cheers. All right, for our guests and John Furrier, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE live from Chicago, Ansible Fest 22. John and I will be right back with our next guest, so stay tuned.